Mary Meet, Annie here. This is actually a second half response to a topic from a viewer, which was uh, asking about if I had changed perspectives. He asked, discussed a topic or two that you've changed perspectives on, which I answered in the first part of this video, the, what, the video before this one. But the second part of his topic was, I'd be particularly interested in how UU involvement has shaped such perspective changes. Okay, for those of you who don't know, UU is Unitarian Universalism. And it is a greater spiritual community that I'm part of. I only mean greater in that beyond the confines of paganism in my life, there is this other circle. You know, the circles in our lives all overlap each other in many different ways. Well, Unitarian Universalism, Unitarian Universalism is one of my circles. I didn't have any indi indication that what Unitarian Universalism was until I was 50. I did have a sense of universalism because of having studied different kinds of religions and understanding that there was a concept that whatever God is, it was universally available to everyone. Salvation was universally available to everyone. Universalism has been around since the, what, 20s, 30s, 40s? And at some point, the Universalist Church combined with Unitarian Church, which is um, a Christian perspective, and they became the Unitarian Universalists. I didn't know about Unitarian Universalists until I was 50. And a friend of mine, who was an elder actually in a Druid community in Charleston, when I was 50, I was between covens at the time, and she thought it was a time for me to investigate who I was in the wider world. She thought I'd been cloistered for too long. I, I think she was probably right. So she encouraged me, number one, to get out and become more involved in environmental uh, volunteerism, politics, you know, community and local things. I, I became an immediate volunteer at the food bank and stayed there for years. But she felt she was a member of the Charleston UU and had been for decades. And she said, you need to go to church. And I was like, I don't go to church. I go to church if somebody's getting married or someone I love is baptizing their child and I want to support them. That's the only time I've ever been to church as an adult. And she says, no, you got to go to a Unitarian Universalist church. I think you need to learn from people with different points of view. And I think your point of view would be valuable to a UU congregation. So that's how I end up visiting a UU church. And I enjoyed it right from the beginning. That first UU church I went to called themselves a fellowship. They didn't use the word church. Different congregations have different words for what they call themselves. In that fellowship, I, number one, there was no one else who identified as a pagan until there was one woman who joined us and we had a conversation, became buds. It was amazing. She's an amazing woman and I'm still blessed to have her in my life. Um, what I found at a UU congregation in that fellowship of community was, it's kind of like paganism in a way because of this large umbrella that we call paganism, with no two of us probably practicing and believing the exact same things. Unitarian Universalism is the same way. There is no dogma, there is no creed. Well, kind of, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But it's the individual search for meaning that matters. You create your own creed if you feel the need to do that. In my first Unitarian Universalist church, there were Christians, there were, and mind you, their Christianity was more understandable to me than some of the more fundamentalist Christians that I had conversations of import with, with respect to them, but I could actually see the logic and want to understand and learn more through the eyes of Unitarian Universalist Christians, which basically are Unitarian Christians. Christians, Jews, Hindus, one pagan who became two pagans and when we moved here and I left my old church we were probably up to maybe 20 pagans. The pagans were evolving, <laughs> growing in the congregation. Thinking who else we had. We had a Buddhist, Taoist, um, science of mind people. 
And the most interesting thing to me, I was part of a group discussion one evening and there was this amazing woman who just, you know how you meet somebody and they just feel like Mother Earth, grandmother, you, she's your sister, she's your mother, she's, she's just an angel, everything about her just, and the things she said were so impactful and so inspiring. And then she mentioned that she was an atheist, not an agnostic who was in search of a relationship with God. She didn't have any need or indication in her life that there was any form, way, shape, or form of deity other than as stories that share the wisdom that humans share. So I talked to her about why does an atheist come to church? <laughs> At the time, I guess I didn't realize that the pagan who went to church was asking the atheist who went to church what you're doing here. And she told me, and I got this from the heart of my pagan practice, when I come to church, when I'm in fellowship with everyone here, I come in the doors me, I sit in our sanctuary as we, and then I have a sense of this greater thing that we become when we're together. Well, that aligns to what I say when I bless a circle at the start of it. We are together. We are more than we can ever be apart. It is by our presence we declare this space sacred. She and I thought so much alike on connection and unity and nature. The, she heard the same cries of pain from nature as I did. She was a very extreme activist when it came to environmental issues. I don't think I ever found anything that was different between the two of us. In fact, she almost seemed like a higher, more developed me, <laughs> except for the fact that deity didn't enter into the picture for her. So talk about perspective changes. Taking that outside of that you-you environment, I began to have an appreciation, and you probably picked up on some of it in my deist, non-deist video I did just a, a week or two back. I stopped expecting the people I met in wider circles and even within the own, my own tradition to be like me. It became very interesting and challenging for me to step back from assumptions and really get to know what folks believed and why they did what they did. I don't know why that was an epiphany for me at 50. I probably made some wrong assumptions in my pagan community about similarities, but it was a definite change in perspective for me. So there's a power in the finding of common ground that it's actually aided me and it's informed and shaped who I am in the pagan community and what I teach. You know, my teachings aren't for everybody because someone might want a teacher who says, this is the way it is, this is what you'll do, this is what you'll believe, and this is it. Sometimes it's easier when somebody spoon feeds you that. I don't teach that way because I don't live that way. Unitarian Universalism also encourages that we explore all spiritual traditions, that words of wisdom exist in all of them. Well, that helps in my perspectives in the pagan path because I am open to all pantheons, all traditions, all the different ways under that pagan umbrella. And there's so many colorful and vibrant and wise versions of who we are, and you can learn from every single one of them. So I thought for you who to make the way here and for those of you who are exploring Unitarian Universalism, because <sighs> Since I made that first video, I have probably had about 30 people tell me that they actually visited a Unitarian Universalist fellowship near their homes, and they're now happy members. I'm not proselytizing. They didn't even know that Unitarian Universalism existed, and that there was a place for them to step out and into a spiritual community, a community of faith, as we call ourselves, and they actually met pagans in the process of doing that. So let me talk about something that's kind of official Unitarian Universalism. We have seven principles. Like I said, we don't have particular creed or dogma, but we have things that we agree on. Let's say the foundation upon which 
Unitarian Universalism sits. Seven principles are very important to us. The first principle is the inherent dignity and worth of every person. It's a tricky one. It's very complicated. You, you spend hours in com conversation about this because someone who we have no respect for or someone who is violent or destructive to society, to our view, has the same right to be thought of as having inherent worth and dignity. Whoa, that's a challenge beyond my means sometimes, but it's worth aspiring to it. That also means in my pagan practices, it has helped me when we talk about changing perspectives, that's what this video is about, it has helped me to be step back when I encounter a conversation or I see witch wars or I see traditions who are disrespectful of each other even within a tradition where someone's judging, ha, huh, you're not as good at this as I am. It's allowed me to step back, to think of individuals, understand their struggle in the world is different than my struggle in the world, their reality might be very different, and think of the fact that each of us, myself included, has that inherent, inherent, inherent dignity and worth of person. The second principle has to do with justice, equality, and compassion in human relations. Again, it plays out in the wider world of paganism, where we see a lot of things play out that sometimes may not seem healthy. They may seem destructive, but there's often a way to work it out in community to the better of all of us. Also, within a circle, which is where I have most of my experiences at the intimate level, is what you do to, especially if you're holding the power of the circle, if you're priest or priestess, what you do within that world to make sure that everyone in your circle is treated fairly and equally and with compassion. Deepened my understanding to that. The third principle is acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth. It refers to it, spiritual growth in our congregations, but often when we talk about this third principle, it's understanding that others are going through their search, it's their path, and respecting what they're doing and supporting it. And that is an awful powerful addition to or reinforcement of what we already know as pagans. No two of us are going to be alike. So rather than have an opinion about somebody else's journey, why don't you support them in their true quest to find their way forward and reciprocally they to you. The fourth principle, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. This is probably one of my favorite principles. Actually, I struggle with some of the principles. I'm not going to lie. They can feel dogmatic to me. But the free and responsible truth for free and responsible search for truth and meaning. To me, it's the experiential nature of who we are as pagans that you can suggest to us and you can set us free to then experiment and experiment and experience on our own. But we can't be confined. We have to be free at an individual level to do what we have to do, to take whatever we're exploring as far as we want to. Someone else may think it's not far enough or we've gone way over the edge. Free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Getting to the, the depth of why am I doing what I do? What do I believe in? Who do I call out to? Who are my allies? Who are the people in my community? What do they mean to me? All of it is a personal search. The fifth principle is the right of conscious and the use of democratic process. This played out a lot for me in a circle I was part of when I was in my 40s into early 50s. So this is one, three circles ago. And we went through a time of, let's take crisis within the circle. What we had, there was enough love to get through it. And what we needed was, there was differences of opinions we needed to come to an opinion, which we either agreed with or agreed to support on behalf of the circle. And that's played out for me in well, all kinds of activities with 
church, with volunteerism, in the wider community. It used to be very important when I was at work. And it was very important to me in circle. And the one and only time I was involved in a convention kind of a situation, what it took to arrange for that and go through varying opinions and disagreements and get to a place of consensus. Consensus is just an important part of circle life and I think communal pagan life. The sixth principle, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. A little trite that's been there back to the days of Flaming American patriotism, as you can tell by that. It almost feels like flag waving at the Unitarian Universalist level. But world community and the importance of if you are willing to step outside your solo practice to engage with others, if you're willing to step outside your coven experience to realize that there's a network of those who are practicing like you and not like to you, we're bigger than me. We're bigger than my coven. We become bigger than all of that. We're a world presence. The days when we were hidden in some ways it still exists to people like me who will never step away from what we know is the true meaning behind the hidden children of the goddess. But that has nothing to do with in the world to educate and be present to and experience be part of the interfaith dialogue of the world and also our own world community of pagans. There's a lot of difference in practices from country to country, the more you get to know people. And let's see the last principles, respect for the interdependent web of all existence which we are a part. Well, obviously as a pagan, that didn't have to be anything that was news to me. It's all about the interdependent web, knowing that everything we do echoes. It echoes on the three levels of this world, the energetic world, the ether, and who knows what other worlds, the afterworld, the before world, who knows? Nothing we do is in a vacuum. And that principle just reinforced that it's not just we pagans who think that. Okay, there's a little bit more left of this. There are six sources for Unitarian Universalism in congregations. So the seven principles and the six sources, that kind of equals what we are. Sorry for the re reset. My camera goes off after, I think, 20 minutes, and I wanted to reset before it did it. So here's the sources. Think of this in terms of who you are as a pagan if you're watching this, and tell me that this doesn't resonate with you. Direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and openness to the forces which create and uphold life. Tell me that openness to experiences of transcendency isn't exactly what we're looking for in our circles, in our solo work, in our communal work, where we are connecting to whatever is greater, no matter what we're naming it in that particular environment. The second source, words and deeds of prophetic people. In the pagan path, if we know our history, we know we come from so many sources. Very few of our traditions are pure in their history. Some are, some are, well, pretty much so. Majority of us were a hodgepodge collection of the influences of many cultures, many times throughout history, sometimes many gods. Words and deeds of prophetic people, those who have come before, the ancient ones, the ancestors, all who come before who have words of wisdom to advise us. The third source, wisdom from the world's religions, which inspires us to our ethical and spiritual life. It's interesting how when you spend time comparing religion to religion, some of the things that we consider, like harm none, aspects of that show up through all time. All time. It's not saying we never harm anyone, or anything, but in the traditions who have had something like that through history, it tends to be whatever you're doing, do it aligned with your gods or your highest best will, and then do it. Tricky. We can talk about that for a long time, but 
it's a common finding out that what we explore in paganism is true historically and seeing it pop up in sermons and discussions at church from many different religious and historical perspectives has it's definitely been something that has reinforced some things I believed and made me explore them deeper. Um, this, the one, two, three, the fourth source, I don't like it. I'm going to be honest with you, I don't like it. I think it's outdated and it needs to come out of the sources. My apologies to you who might watch this who disagree with me. I believe that this source is already part of wisdom from the world's religions, but for some reason, maybe because when these were written a while ago, we thought in terms, especially here in America, that most people were either Jewish or Christian. So the next source says Jewish and Christians' teachings, which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. I have nothing with the loving our neighbors as ourselves. I do have a problem with separating out those two traditions when we've already mentioned in the previous one, the wisdom from the world's religions. <laughs> That's anything. And I have debated this with ministers and congregants. Some people agree with me, and especially if they're Jewish or Christian, they might not because they really want to be sure that their teachings show up in church every now and then. The next to the last source is humanist teachings, which counsel us to heed the guise and guise guidance of reason and the results of science. This is an important one for me when I take it to my pagan practices. Yeah, we're witness to a lot in our circles. We're witness to a lot when we work our magics. We're witness to a lot when we work with the elements and become one with various different kinds of energies. And part of that is experiencing what they are, at the same time stepping back from turning it into such a mystical folkloric experience that we lose the, re the realism of it. Does that make sense to you practitioners? Um, we can glorify some of these things that are part of our practices when they're probably a lot more pragmatic than we'd like to imagine they are. It's kind of the danger sometimes that newbies make newbies of any age, by the way, um, you know, we're not as exotic as we like sometimes to think we are. And the last one, which was added in, I think, the 70s sometime, so it's the most recent of the sources, and you're going to love this, my friends, spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythm of nature. Well, it didn't have to change my perspective because obviously that kind of describes who I am, doesn't it? However, what it changed is my perspective on speaking to others who know nothing about my practices about that. You learn a lot about yourself when, have you ever been in a position, you're at a gathering someplace and maybe there's you, know, you as the only pagan or maybe just a couple of you and you get cornered by somebody who says, I want you to tell me what your religion is. You know, how can we put in a sentence or two, who we are. So my shift in perspective in regard to this in my congregations has been, I've gotten better at saying who I am. I've gotten better at, I have an elevator speech in a way to those who know nothing about my practices. And I have kind of a more sophisticated elevator speech for those who know something. You gotta watch out then, because sometimes the something they know is they've seen Buffy or one of those media type representations of who we might be. But it's still a place to start a conversation. So my shift in perspective there has been outside of the pagan community, how can I present who I am in a way that's not overkill and overload that allows me to engage in conversations with folks who well, I may think they're a lot different than I. I almost always find out they're not so. So I hope it might be a bit of an overkill, but I realize that I'm going to get pagans and you use who will be drawn to the topic of this video. I want to end this video with something that's currently, as I record this, on the website for the Umbrella Organization for Unitarian Universalism. If you're interested in learning more about it, it's uua.org. But there's something there that I just think summarizes that experience beautifully. Live your values aloud, not alone. Our open-minded, 
open-hearted spiritual communities help people lead lives of justice, love, learning, and hope. I could use those very same words to describe my relationships to the covens I've been part of and the wide, wider pagan community. If you have any questions, want me to follow up on anything in here, maybe it was overkill, but I've had a lot of people want to know more about the witch that goes to church. And I wanted to give that full attention in this video. And to the viewer who originally asked how being a UU has influenced me as a witch, as a Wiccan, as a pagan, I hope I've given some examples in there that you might find interesting. I wish you all mirth and reverence, Mary Park. <laughs>